What's up, everyone? Welcome back to Draft Season Never Ends, the Aftermath's NFL Draft Podcast. I am Chris Malin, host of the show, and another big week of football action. Tons to talk about. Amazing college football playoff semifinal Saturday with tons to get into on New Year's Eve. And uh, But I'm going to actually take this a bit of a different direction than what I was anticipating tonight. Uh, just to lead this off, and uh, it's Monday night, it's uh, Happy New Year everybody, it's January 2nd, 2023, we're officially into the year of the 2023 NFL Draft, very excited about that, but uh, some really kind of jarring events tonight, and I was watching Monday Night Football, expecting a fantastic matchup between the Bills and the Bengals, and uh, ended up being a shocking turn of events as DeMar Hamlin makes a tackle on T. Higgins, uh, he's defensive back for The Buffalo Bills making a a tackle on wide receiver for the Cincinnati Bengals in the first quarter of the game. And he ended up going down, ended up needing uh, CPR on the field, and ended up actually exiting the field via ambulance. Uh, He's currently in a local hospital. As of now, I know his his status is he's uh, in critical uh, critical condition. And that's about all I really know at this point. The game has been postponed. It was temporarily suspended. It has been since postponed. Uh, As I'm recording this, I really don't have any other additional details than that. But I just felt like I couldn't really lead this off with anything else but that. Obviously, thoughts and prayers with the Hamlin family. And I really hope that this young man, who's 24 years old, he's younger than I am, is really going to be okay. It was a scary situation all the way around. It's kind of remarkable to even be sitting here thinking about that that is what unfolded tonight on Monday Night Football. Not at all what any of us going into that game were expecting. And there are all sorts of football implications, of course, with all of that. And it'll be interesting to see how that gets resolved. But the biggest thing here is that uh, I really just hope this young man is okay. I mean, he's a fantastic young player. He's a second-year player out of the University of Pittsburgh. Uh, really just been a pretty integral part to what the Buffalo Bills have done on defense this year, filling in for Micah Hyde, who's been out uh, pretty much the entire season with injury. So uh, Hamlin will certainly be missed on the field, and I, I sincerely hope that whatever has happened here is something that he will be able to walk away from because that was a, a truly scary situation and uh, uh, just truly un- unbelievable. really makes you reconsider a lot of the the violent totality that comes within football. And it's something that I think we talk about quite a bit. We're all aware of it, right? It's a violent sport. It's it's just the nature of it. It's how it's designed. They have obviously health and safety protocols and, and rules in place for player safety. But, you know, sometimes stuff like this happens and it's really hard to be able to continue to try and move forward. But I wanted to acknowledge that tonight and, and really hoping that DeMar Hamlin is okay and uh, and sincerely, sincerely hoping that we will get a chance to get an update soon on his status and, and hopefully find out some good news in the very near future. So uh, tough to transition out of this, no question about it, but I wanted to acknowledge that early on. I do want to get to a lot of what I was planning on talking about tonight, and, and that was a, a really fantastic weekend of college football, a truly, truly incredible Saturday of college football. It started off with the Sugar Bowl. I'm not going to spend as much time on that, but Congrats to Alabama winning another Sugar Bowl there and taking care of Kansas State, looking like uh, they could have very well been uh, in the college football playoff mix. However, hard to really argue they should have been in there over any of the four teams that were competing because those were two fantastic semifinal games. We've been waiting nine years for a semifinal Saturday quite like this. It was incredible. First game, TCU-Michigan. Just uh, just tons of fireworks, especially in that third quarter. 42 combined points between those two teams. Incredible action from start to finish. And TCU pulls off the stunning upset and advances the national championship game. I mean, this team, I think, was finished, I think, picked to finish seventh in the Big 12 at the beginning of the season. They were unranked. They did not receive an AP vote at the beginning of the season, and now they are competing for a national championship. Unbelievable what Sonny Dykes has been able to do in his first year with the Horned Frogs. And shout out to Max Duggan, Heisman runner-up this year. It's been nothing short of incredible. The story there was slated to be the backup behind Chandler Morris, uh, an Oklahoma transfer. Ended up staying at the school and got a break in his favor where we ended up seeing an injury to Morris. Duggan comes in, never gave the job back because he played lights out all year long. He had his ups and downs in this game, no question about it, but just truly an incredible heartwarming story for him. And I'm 
happy to see that he seems to be uh, on the right track. I want to talk a little bit about his draft status and his draft, uh, I think, prospects in just a little bit here. But uh, And then the second game, as if the first one couldn't be top. Somehow the second game was probably even better. Georgia, Ohio State goes down to the wire. A missed kick from 50 yards out ends up deciding it. I mean, just a, a wild day overall. Best, uh, talk a lot about C.J. Stroud in just a minute. We're talking about some of the guys that aren't really eligible until next year either because a lot of those players were on the field in that game and impressed in a big way or maybe should have been used a little bit differently. Uh, so lots to talk about there. But uh, just had to start with that. Just an unbelievable, unbelievable semifinal Saturday in college football. And genuinely, I... I cannot be more excited about this championship game that follows as well. I know people are saying they're writing it off, saying, ah, it probably won't be very competitive. Georgia opening as almost a two-touchdown favorite over TCU. I think it'll be closer than that. I'm really, really excited for that. We're going to talk more about that game later in the week. I promise we'll do a preview of the national championship game as we start to really get into uh, draft season, the heart of it, I should say, uh, as college you know, all-star games will be following very quickly after that, of course. So, uh, But let's let's start with this first game here. We're going to focus on some draft takeaways here. There's some bigger picture things within college football that I think can be talked about. Obviously, a uh, rough day for the Big Ten. Jim Harbaugh seems like he may be headed back to the NFL, according to some reports, and maybe that's not a terrible idea, given some of the decision-making that went on during that game, especially on goal-to-go situations. So we'll see what ends up happening here. But one of the biggest takeaways from this game for me is that Quentin Johnson, as of right now, I I think he's wide receiver one. I haven't really done a ton of homework yet in terms of in-depth studying of this wide receiver class, but he's up there with Jackson Smith and Jigba and with Jordan Addison. I think Quentin Johnson is a top guy on the board at this point. He reminds me he plays a little bit similar to what we saw from Drake London a year ago at USC. Big body player, capable of stretching the field, but he can be a possession guy as well. Uh, The the play that, of course, everybody is going to be focusing on here is catching that shallow cross, making a man miss, and then turning on the Jets and going 76 yards to the house. You don't see that from a player his size. Like, that's not normal to see from a player of his build and stature and play style. That's just not what you would expect from him. He's a jump ball receiver, right? He's a deep threat. And instead, he's taking a shallow cross, turning it upfield, and see ya. You're not catching that man. Uh, truly an eye-opening play for, I think, a lot of people to watch. There are definitely some questions. He's not the shiftiest, right? He's not as shifty or as nimble as Jackson Smith and Jigba or as uh, Jordan Addison, but that's some of what you have to trade off here, right? You have a much bigger catch radius. You obviously have much bigger hands, longer arms, all of that to throw to if you're a quarterback looking for your receiver. So he might have quite as much separation, but you have a much bigger window and, uh, I guess, bigger margin for error to throw into there when you have a player like Quentin Johnson. So I just truly blew me away. He's been one of my favorite players to watch all year long. Super impressed. Definitely have a first-round grade on him at this point. Like I said, a lot of film study still to go to kind of figure out who the top receiver in this draft class is going to be. But in a year where Addison obviously dominated, JSN struggled with injuries, and, and Johnson has played out of his mind in the second half, I think it's going to be hard to argue that Johnson won't be the first receiver off the board. Lots of work still to do, long way to go, but man, that guy really impressed and I think made himself quite a bit of money in this game. Uh, I want to talk about another player here that was on TCU's side as well. Kendry Miller ended up leaving the game with an injury, and uh, he's somebody that I'm actually really intrigued by because he's a great blend of speed and power. Uh, He's bigger than you might expect given how fast he plays. Uh, He's like 6'2", about 215, 220. Right, he's a pretty good size profile for what you're looking for in an NFL running back, and he's got that game-breaking speed. He's somebody that I think maybe we've overlooked a little bit, and and could be in the mix to maybe be the second or third running back off the board when you it's all said and done. Again, a lot of work still to be done, a lot of time for these running backs to kind of separate themselves out. But uh, I mean, Jameer Gibbs is certainly in that conversation as well, uh, and you know you're going to continue to see Devin A. Chain as well from Texas A&M. There's some really good running backs in this class, and I think Miller is one of those guys that you need to be starting to talk about in that second tier. Bijan Robinson is in a class of his own, the running back out of Texas. Nobody's going to touch him. He should be the first running back off the board. He should probably be a top 20 pick in this upcoming draft. I don't know that anybody else is going to quite crack the first round. Maybe we see somebody else sneak into the back end of the first round if there's a running back that a team that needs a running back and feels like they have a you know it's a good 
value proposition, whatever it might be. There's obviously so much of this that has been discussed about where running backs stand within the draft kind of stratosphere and, and what their true value is. Should we be spending first round picks on them? Uh, we haven't seen a ton of it recently, obviously. There's been a, a huge drop back in first round running backs, especially in running backs that you see going in the top half of the first round. You don't really see that happen a whole lot anymore, at least not in recent years. So um, I think Kendry Miller is definitely, like I said, in that second tier of backs. You put him in there, like I said, with uh, Jameer Gibbs, Devon, uh, Devon A. Chain, possibly Sean Tucker, even though he had a bit of a rough year as well. And I think Miller is right there within that group. Like I said, there's a lot more work I got to do on this whole running back class. I've been doing mostly work on offensive, defensive linemen at this point, edge rushers, the, the like. So uh, I'm excited to dive into that group a little bit more in depth in the coming weeks here. But uh, yeah, he super, very much impressed me in the limited time. And you can see the difference. Uh, as good as TCU's, the rest of their backfield is, uh, the difference in not having Miller on the field for the rest of the game, it definitely felt like they had to rely on Duggan more to use his legs and to throw the ball a bit more. And there were some times where it really felt like they missed Kendra Miller and uh, would have been great to have him back out there on the field. It would have made a big impact, I think, in the second half of that TCU game. Uh, one last note here on the Michigan side of things. Uh, obviously underwhelmed by the defense, really kind of expected more. Um, there's a couple of guys on here, Mike Sansrill, uh, who's a nickel corner for them that I was pretty high on, thought he had a really strong season his first year playing defensive back. Uh, he, he'd been a wide receiver previously, had uh, you know, made the transition over to the defensive side of the ball. Uh, had an interception, which was great for him, but uh, kind of thought I would see a little bit more from him in this game. Didn't expect the, the you know 51 points to be given up. I know there were two defensive touchdowns from TCU, but 37 points still if you take away those two defensive touchdowns. Quite a bit to give up there, and so yeah, definitely a disappointing performance all the way around for the Michigan defense. And then on the flip side, I, I have to say, I, I think it was really disappointing that that was how the game ended for Michigan center Olu Olomitidi, uh, Olomitidi, excuse me, because I think he played a really good game overall. I, I think Olomitidi, Olomitini, excuse me, managed to play a really strong game, looked strong in the run game, pass blocked well, uh, unfortunately had a late penalty, and then ended up uh, ended up with that bad snap. You know, clearly just J.J. McCarthy, not ready for it, hadn't called for it. Ohm Timi snaps it, and that's it. You know, ends up being the final play of the game for Michigan. Turns out to be a kind of haphazard attempt to lateral it around and ends up winding up. That's the final play of the game. Uh, really unfortunate way to go out, and obviously a sour note for him to end his college career on most likely. I expect that he'll going he'll be going to the NFL draft. We'll have to see if he officially declares. But um, one of the top interior linemen in this class, and I, I really do think he will still end up going fairly high. Obviously a, a rough moment for him there, but uh, I think it kind of overshadows what was a really pretty strong performance from him overall in this game. Let's flip to the second game here because, I mean, there's so much to talk about in this one. My, my goodness. I mean, for, we got to start with C.J. Stroud. There's no other place to begin with this. C.J. Stroud played the best game of his college career in what was unfortunately for him a losing effort on Saturday. Uh, Georgia's defense, talked about it all year, one of the best defensive units, fantastic group all the way around, uh, really had not been kind of torched by anybody throughout the course of the year. Uh, LSU ended up hanging 30 on them in a 20-point loss still in the SEC championship game, and, and Georgia had that well in hand, kind of called off the dogs a little bit. Uh, pun intended on that one, yes. Uh, but they managed to, I think, kind of get some garbage time points there. LSU played well, but it wasn't like they were putting up huge numbers. And instead, we're talking about Ohio State, 41 points in this game. And honestly, save a Marvin Harrison Jr. injury that knocked him out of the game and not having Jackson Smith and Jig to begin with, I, I think maybe Ohio State wins this game. I mean, that, that was how prolific this passing offense was. I mean, it's truly amazing to see. And, and the biggest thing from Stroud is that he made plays off schedule. He rolled out of the pocket. He stepped up in the pocket. He dealt with the pressure all night long. He made some of those off-platform throws. He managed to extend plays and figure out where to go when his first read wasn't there. The play broke down. All the things that we criticize C.J. Stroud for all year long. Now, it's one game, right? We can't completely ignore everything that we've seen up to this point. But 
That was the best that we've ever seen C.J. Stroud look. I mean, just truly on a different level, look like an NFL caliber, NFL quarterback. I shouldn't even say NFL caliber, just an NFL quarterback in that game against what is an NFL caliber defense in a lot of ways, or at least a lot of guys that will be playing on Sundays when it's all said and done. And I mean, I think that you, you got to give Stroud a ton of credit here. I went into the season thinking he was going to be QB1. He kind of slid a little bit, didn't have quite as prolific a year, had some rough patches here or there, some games where he maybe underwhelmed a little bit. I mean, but this definitely, I think, puts him back at least in the conversation. Uh, excited to see kind of what he looks like at the combine, goes through all the testing and stuff like that. And I think that's going to be really big for Bryce Young, who... As much as I love Bryce Young, I think he's a gamer, right? He's just a guy that seems completely unfazed by any moment he is ever in. Doesn't matter what the situation is. Bryce Young is going out there thinking, yeah, I got this, no problem. As much as I love that calm poise that he brings to the table, he's a lot smaller than Stroud, right? He's a bit undersized, and I worry about whether or not he's going to hold up in the NFL. He's taking a ton of hits, taking those shots, and just keeps on rolling in college, but it's a different monster, right? You, you see the NFL, it's much more physical, it's the best of the best on defense. So there are some question marks that I think Bryce Young is still going to have to kind of overcome some limitations physically that he will have to overcome. I think he can do it. I don't think, I'm, I'm not saying, oh, you can't draft him, he's not a good player. I'm just saying there's going to be those questions that all those things are going to exist with him. That doesn't happen with C.J. Stroud. Obviously, Young, I think, has had the more impressive college career, but I think Stroud is potentially the better pro prospect still. A lot of work still to be done on this quarterback class. Long way to go. Want to keep going back to this film because, like I said, Bryce Young, a fantastic player, and you can't discount as well. He had a great, great, great game against Kansas State in the Sugar Bowl. So I'm excited to go back and watch that one, study the tape for both these players a little bit more in depth, but... I mean, I had to start with C.J. Stroud here when talking about this Georgia-Ohio State game. I mean, on the flip side, as much as I'm praising right now a guy like C.J. Stroud, and we talked about Marvin Harrison Jr., you got to go to the other side. The Georgia defense, man, this was bad, like really concerningly bad, because this is not the type of performance that we would have expected from this Georgia defense. Sure, you thought Ohio State was going to put up some points. That was to be given. I mean, that's a great offense. You're not going to be able to totally shut them down. But Keely Ringo who people have had as a first-round corner. I went into the year thinking he might even be a top-10 pick. He looked like he didn't belong on the field for much of this game. He got torched left and right. Uh, Best explanation I think I saw of the night was Matt Miller, who now works as an ESPN NFL draft analyst. And he just tweeted out, he was like, hey, Ringo is a a, a brawler, kind of a, a, a bully. He's not a ballerina, right? And that's fair. Uh, that's not his play style. He's not always going to play the prettiest out there. You know, he's, he's much more of a physical type. Uh, he's obviously got long arms, long limbs, great hands that he can use to break up passes and stuff like that. Very physical at the line of scrimmage. It doesn't really matter if you're getting beat off the line and you, you can't seem to make up for it downfield. Uh, I mean, he got torched all night long. The whole Georgia secondary really did. But uh, you know, Ringo was one that they picked on quite a bit. And I have to say, that is really concerning, and it's going to be something that I think sends a lot of scouts back to the tape, because there were already some questions that were starting to bubble up in the build-up to this game, and he's going to have to answer some questions. If he goes up against Quentin Johnson from TCU in this championship game, and he has another performance like that, forget first round. You'll be lucky to see that guy go before the end of day two. I mean, there's going to be so many question marks about Keely Ringo and the competition level that he faced, obviously, has been great in the SEC. But when you go up against guys that we know are NFL caliber receivers and Marvis Harrison Jr. and and, uh, um, and Buka from Ohio State, and then you, know, you have another bad day against Quentin Johnson from TCU, there's going to be a lot of questions asked about you, and you're not going to be a first-round prospect at that point. I, I just think there's going to be too many red flags around him uh, from a coverage standpoint that scouts and front offices are going to look and say, "Uh uh-uh, not for us. Maybe he's a developmental guy we can work on, but he's not ready to start from day one. And then, of course, there's Jalen Carter, who is the number one player on my big board entering all of this, and I thought we're going to be this game-wrecking force, and he had been the entire last 10, 11 games of the season for Georgia, but he kind of disappeared. He really didn't do a whole lot. And you got to give credit to, obviously, the interior of that Ohio State offensive line. Fantastic performance by them. Uh, and, you know, Georgia generated some pres- uh, pressure on C.J. Stroud. We talked about the only reason that he's making those plays off-platform and needing to move around in the pocket and av- avoid the pressure is because Georgia's creating pressure. But it was a pretty quiet night for Jalen Carter, and you would have expected a lot more from him on this stage. He's a player that 
they always lean on and you would think was going to step up and perform in a big way. But this is something we've seen from Carter before, unfortunately. He's had these stretches where he will disappear a little bit. And on a big stage like this, that's not what you wanted to see. You wanted to see this guy rise to the occasion and prove to everybody, hey, I deserve the number one player drafted, number one uh, you know, position player on everybody's board. It doesn't matter. you know, I shouldn't say that position player, but regardless of position, he should be the number one player coming off the board. And you didn't see it. And it was really kind of concerning to me that you didn't see that. Like I said, Ohio State's interior offensive line, offensive line as a whole, is really good. Really, really strong unit. Good chance that those two tackles, Dewan Jones and Paris Johnson, uh, yeah, Paris Johnson Jr., are going to be drafted in the top 100. You know, Johnson looking like he might be a first round pick. Jones ha- in the mix, at least, to be that as well. Probably top 50 picks, really, in this upcoming draft. But that's still not a really good excuse if you think that you're the, the, we, we think that he should be the top player on the board. You know, yes, you can have a bad game. There's no question about that. But it just kind of felt like he disappeared, and there was really no indication of like, oh, well, you know, they're they're you know double teaming him here, or they really have schemed everything to kind of go away from him and make sure that he wasn't an impact player. I'm sure they did. I'm sure there was definitely some element of that. But even still, the best players usually find a way to overcome that and still have some sort of impact on the game, even if it's a more muted one than what we might have expected. And we saw pretty much nothing out of Carter all night. Uh, And so, yeah, Georgia defense definitely had a great day, you know, great day for them. I'm not going to overreact here and say, okay, Carter's not the number one player anymore. You got to go back to the film, rewatch this, and this doesn't undo everything that we've seen from him this year, which has just been at a different level, right? I mean, just incredible, incredible production from a pass rushing standpoint in terms of collapsing the pocket, putting quarterbacks under pressure. I know it doesn't always result in a ton of sacks, but he's getting in there, impacting plays, forcing quarterbacks off their spot, and just impacting everything that the offense has to do from a game planning standpoint. I'm not going to throw all of that out just because of one game, but this is definitely a bit of a red flag and something that's going to have to be, you know, wait a little bit when you're having those conversations about who should be the first, you know, player on the big board. Should it be Will Anderson Jr., who's been super steady, unbelievable production at Alabama, or should it be Jalen Carter, who has shown elite physical traits and might have the ability to just wreck games at the next level, but has occasionally disappeared. A lot of conversation, I think, still needs to be had about that. I, I broke the two down in my last episode. I did actually, Will Anderson and Jalen Carter. And I said at the end of it, I would have picked Carter, right? That would be my guy if I had to pick somebody right now as, okay, let's say, who's the number one player on my big board? I was going with Carter. I feel like that's shaking a little bit. I'm not willing to completely back down from that yet, but we'll see what happens here. Definitely going to have to continue to evaluate the, these players. There's still a lot more time before draft day for those decisions and those opinions to change. Uh, that's going to just about do it for in terms of this recap here. I mean, there's tons more I could get into, uh, you know, talking about Brock Bowers not being involved mu- enough on the Georgia side of it. Stetson Bennett continuing to look like an NFL quarterback. We're going to talk more about that at some point for sure. I'm not sure. That, I'm not saying he can be a first round pick by any means, but you know, it could be a maybe day three pick and, you know, be a solid player that ends up making an NFL roster, be a solid backup, maybe a spot starter somewhere in the league. That certainly feels in the realm of outcomes here, realistic outcomes for Stetson Bennett, given what we've seen so far from him in his college career. Anyway, we'll we'll get more into the quarterbacks as, you know, the draft season rolls on and and we get closer and closer to draft day. But for now, I'll leave it at impressive performance from Stetson Bennett and the offense, concerning performance from the Georgia defense. We'll definitely need to see what Kirby Smart can do, can right the ship a little bit and see if they can get back on track. But I appreciate everybody for tuning into this one, Uh, late night recording Lighting is a little bit weird here if you're watching on YouTube right now. But hey, we're making it work. So um, like I said, if you can watch the show on YouTube, you can also find us on uh, any of your podcast platforms, Spotify, Stitcher, Apple Podcasts, Anchor, wherever you get your podcast should be available. You should be able to just search Draft Season Never Ends, and it should come up. If you cannot find it on your favorite podcast platform, feel free, reach out, let me know. I'm on social media, Aftermath Sports on Twitter and on Facebook. You can reach out there, leave a comment, tweet at me, DM me, any of that good stuff, feel free to reach out, uh, and I will do my best to make that happen. No promises. I can't always guarantee that I can get it on every podcast platform, but it should be on most, and if you just so happen that you cannot find it there, I'll do my best to make it happen. So, um, yeah, we'll, we'll get on that and, and see what I can make happen there. But thanks as always for tuning in. As always, feel free to rate, review, subscribe, share with friends, let other people know about it. Um, you know, great feedback that I've gotten so far. It's been fun. I've had a good chance and really enjoyed getting back behind the mic and hopefully going to be doing this consistently. Uh, 
aiming for two episodes again this week, as I said. Hopefully going to be kind of a be Tuesday and Thursday cadence. We'll see what ends up happening. Wasn't able to do this past week. Had a wake and a funeral to go to, unfortunately. So uh, I couldn't squeeze in another episode in there. It was just too much traveling. And honestly, just didn't really feel quite up to it at that point. So, uh, But yeah, wanted to make sure that I reacted to everything we saw on Saturday. And uh, really, really looking forward to talking even more. Going to be doing a national championship preview, like I said, I think on Thursday. So make sure you check back in and keep an eye out for that. So with that, though, draft season never ends. Remember that, and make sure you keep it locked here as I'll get you all set for the 2023 NFL Draft and, of course, beyond reaction as we get through the draft and we start looking ahead to 2024 as well. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in. Really appreciate it. You guys will hear from me again soon.